Hello, everyone, and welcome. I wanted to make a descriptive video kind of telling you some of the tips and tricks that I used to hit rank 400 in Marvel Snap. So first things first, just uh, as you can see, I'm collection 2300. So I started in global release, so I didn't start in beta, so I don't have like every card. Uh, but I did, was able to still hit 400 in a Marvel Snap. So that's pretty cool, pretty sick. Pat on my back. But we can get started with some of the strategies that I used. So first of all, I'm sure you want to know what my deck list is, right? What what deck did I use? Is that important? And I used a, a Dark Hog Zabu deck. So unfortunately... I do have a series five card, Dark Hawk, um, and that card is not replaceable. So it's a pretty important piece of the puzzle for this particular deck. Does this mean only this deck will work? No, there are other strong decks to use, but uh, since I'm global release, I don't have as many options as maybe some of the other players. So um, I got Dark Hawk from the collection uh, track. So that was pretty lucky on my part. and. Use that to climb to 400. All right. So next things first. I just want to say cards do matter, right? So I'm not going to lie to you. Uh, having good cards, having more options is definitely going to make the climb easier. Not being able to play some of the really strong series four or five cards is definitely going to limit uh, how fast you can climb. Does that mean you need uh, new cards or series four or five cards to make infinite? No, or to climb high? No. But do they give you more options, more freedom? And are some of the really strong decks going to be using series four or five cards? Absolutely. So I don't want to lie to you, say, oh, you don't really need any any card use only pull two cards you can still climb you can still climb but it's definitely going to be harder it's definitely going to be slower and that's really the important thing if you want to climb super high super fast you're going to need really all the tools available all the all the deck archetypes that feel strong to you so using having access to more cards is going to increase how fast you can climb so you know bad news out of the way there However, I will say that being comfortable with a deck is equally important. Uh, just because uh, two people have the same deck doesn't mean two people are going to climb at the same rate, right? Being comfortable knowing the ins and outs of the deck, what's, why, why you snap, what, when to snap, what locations are good, what locations are bad, uh, how to tell what your opponent's doing and how to play around their strategies, right? It's not... Just having a good cards or all the cards is not going to mean you're going to climb like I did. So you do have to understand how to play the game, uh, the snapping game and the uh, the board state game. And if you don't understand both things, you're not comfortable with a deck. It doesn't really matter how good your cards are. Uh, a tip is if you're playing a deck that you didn't make, not your own, definitely try to watch some games first. I know some of the... Websites don't really give you um, game examples, but if you're copying like a streamer's deck or anything like that, make sure you tune in and watch a couple of their games just to kind of understand the flow of what they're doing, why they're snapping, what they're thinking about. Because if you just pick a deck blindly just because they say people say it's strong and you don't really understand the deck, it's not really going to help you. So just, just make sure that you understand a deck. Uh, before you play it, but you can also understand it while you're playing. So that's why, you know, just being comfortable grinding games out, just make you better with a deck. Even if it might not be the best deck, if you understand it to a, a T, then you're able to win games. Maybe other people wouldn't expect. All right. So one core concept, I'm definitely going to make a, a video solely about this concept, but I have to include it here is that every deck should have a surprise card, a sneaky card, uh, a wow. I didn't expect that card, a card that um, can turn the tides of a game and make it that, oh, my opponent, your opponent thinks they're going to win, but then you play this card and, oh, 
Now you're ahead, you win the game. So these are cards that get you eight Qs. Why they're so important is because uh, you you want to prey on like the human emotion of like, oh, they're, they think they're going to win, but then you turn it around. Cards, there are cards that don't do that pretty well. Like a, a easy card is like Wong. If you play a Wong and they don't have an answer, they're just leaving, right? So uh, same thing with like Galactus. If they play, if you play, if your opponent plays Galactus, you don't have an answer, you're leaving, right? Those are not really uh, the type of cards I would promote. I'd promote cards that turn six, turn five even, you play them and your opponent didn't know that you had that or didn't know that was an acceptable answer. And because of that, they play in, they lose their four or eight cubes and you just walk away like none the wiser. They, they don't have an answer. So I have some examples here. These are not all the options, but these are just like cards to think about. You Every deck should have at least one. More is preferable, but at least one where like arrow is a very common card where Oh, they think they're going to fill a board. Nope. They, you move your arrow over there. Uh, now they lose. Shang-Chi is very obvious, very easy. You Shang-Chi, their biggest, best minion on turn six. Sometimes they don't expect it, and then oh, then they lose. Scarlet Witch is one I run in my deck, right? It, it turns bad locations into good ones, and it can turn the tide of a battle, and it's pretty cheap. So definitely one of my favorites. Killmonger is pretty obvious. Magneto is a very good... Um, surprise card in this particular meta because of zabu zabu you run a lot of tier uh three and four cost cards so magneto can move them all to one location and really surprise them when they think they've won a location you move all of those cards away so i'm uh, definitely going to make a more in-depth video about it but this is just a concept that you want to have in your toolbox where anytime you're building a deck you want to add a card uh, that can surprise people turn six take a cue from them. Next of all, uh, you have to snap to climb. Well, that's not exactly true. You don't have to snap to climb, but if you want to climb quickly, if you want to climb in a, in a reasonable pace, you do have to snap. It's very difficult to really climb fast in one or two cube intervals, right? Like I can, I can win one cube, lose two cubes, win two cubes, win one cube. Right? It's going to take you so many games to really get to infinite, to climb past that. Um, it's, it's really when you're, you're winning eight, eight, winning four, winning eight, winning four. That's really when you're getting such a massive leave uh, um, compared to other people. And, and that's how I've kind of gotten such a huge gap compared to a lot of other players. Because I do snap often. I slept uh, consistently. And something I've noticed, and, and maybe you'll notice as you play, is that uh, some of the best players, they have predictable snap patterns. So I can actually, after I play a couple of games against a particular person, I can actually tell when they're going to snap, when they're not going to snap, what it means if they're not snapping, what it means if they're snapping. So it's actually becomes more of just like a, an, an extra tool that it's not really like a mechanic that I think about. It's like, oh yeah, they're snapping here. This means this for the game. They're snapping here. This means that for the game. And actually like, Having a player snap can actually change how I play. So it's just something that you want to get used to, want to start thinking about when you're playing, like how people snap, why they're snapping, what it means. And especially if you're playing people multiple times, what their snap patterns are. I have some too. Uh, next one. This one's kind of stupid and kind of simple, but uh, Zabu, you know, the season pass right now, probably pass if you're watching this later. A very stupid card right now in the meta. And I know this is like very simple, but it's pretty, it works. And that's, so it's coming in here. If you have Zabu before turn three, just snap. So it's not because, oh, you're going to win if you have Zabu turn three. It's that the state of the game right now really rewards people who snap uh, before turn three. Uh, so if you snap before turn three and you have Zabu, uh, either your player, your opponent's thinking, okay, they have Zabu and I don't, so I'm leaving. Or they they have Zabu and I also have Zabu, so now we're playing a fair game. So even if even if uh, they they stick in, they stay on the board. It's not that you're suddenly behind. It's now you're suddenly having a fair match. Both of your players have Zabu, and then you just play it out. 
But there are going to be some games where people just leave. So you're getting some cubes for free, but then in the scenario where they stick around, now you're just having a normal fair match. And there are also some people that stick around even if they don't have Zabu or they're not playing a Zabu deck and they don't really care. So, you know, having Zabu on turn three, it's pretty simple, it's pretty stupid. I don't like that this is the case, but uh, I will just tell you that this is probably the best idea right now. If you have Zabu turn three, just snap. Next up, we have uh, just a concept you should know. You really should see the first two locations before snapping usually. So we're going to we're going to talk about locations, but um, locations can dramatically change uh, who's favored in the in the game, right? So uh, a bad location can completely screw you up. A good location can completely save you, um, and you want to be snapping usually second or third location optimal is third location but there are some players good players that'll pretty much leave after the third one reveals because they see the three locations they see their hand they already know if they're favored or not and they're gonna leave like i'm one of those players if i see all the three locations and i already know i'm not favored i'm leaving so if you want to like try to get two cubes out of me sometimes you got to snap before that third location reveals and i know oh it's doomed so that's why I'm, this is like high level stuff, but like you definitely want to at least see the first two. You can snap turn one if your hand is amazing. So you can snap turn one, but I would say that that can be very risky because even an amazing hand can lose to two bad locations. So um, especially if you snap turn one, you have a you think you have a good hand, but then you get two bad locations and they have a good hand, but their locations are good for them, then ooh, right? You can instantly lose four cubes. So. You have to be careful with the first one. With this, with two, you 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 have a lot of, uh, you you've seen a lot of the locations, so you can pretty much read the flow. But um, that's just some general tips, some tricks, right, to use. Uh, before you snap, usually see the first two locations unless your hand's insane. Next up, we have to you have to understand how your deck works with locations. Right, that is a very key concept, very important. I'm definitely going to make a video about this concept alone. Uh, but for a tips and tricks guide, I definitely want to mention this: that you have to understand what locations are good for you, what locations are bad for you. So I have some examples on the left side: locations that would be good for my dark arc deck, uh, Kalimar Tar. I use uh, some unreveals. Rocks are good for me in the deck so subterranean is actually good i know a lot of people don't like that location but actually i'm like yes i got this one and then onslaught citadel right zabu really works with it dark arc really works with it so those are some locations i would consider good on the other hand uh crimson cosmo i play zabu it it, it uh, reduces the cost of my cards to two it means that i pretty much can't play anything in that location that so that one's a pretty horrible one for me definitely already feel like leaving if i see this one flip up Isles of Silence, another one. Uh, ongoing effects are disabled here, so it really locks down my options of where I can play my units. And the Lamentous one is like almost an insta leave because uh, you know my linchpin is Dark Hawk. If if Lamentous one comes in, I am pretty screwed because my my Dark Hawks are one power, my mis Mystiques are zero. Like there, it's really bad. So definitely. Having this understanding of, okay, I got good locations I can snap. Okay, I got bad locations. I'm going to play defensively. Uh, that might not be like a, a good, con like a, a familiar concept, like playing defensively, but like just like um, seeing what your opponent's doing. If they're playing really strong power plays, then, you know, being ready to leave, not being uh, baited. Uh, being ready to respond to their snaps, things like that. That's that's more defensive. Where aggressive, you're you're kind of you know snapping immediately, snapping as soon as they make their play. Kind of like oh, I I knew I won already. That kind of thing. It, it's more of like snap mechanics of of how you snap, uh, pretty offensive or defensive. So I could make a video about that, but you know I have a lot of videos to make, so probably not going to do that particular one. But just a just a concept of understanding what locations are good and bad for you. So. Here is here's a, a follow up to that some some uh, examples of what I mean. So one thing you should know your win chances by turn two. 
Um, I would say on average, you should know whether you're favored or not by turn two, and you should be thinking about whether to snap or retreat. So this first example, we have um, the rock, the new future location, the rocks. That one's pretty good for my deck right now because I have a death in it. And then you have Kalamatar. We saw earlier that that's actually a pretty good location for me. So um, already by this, uh, this turn, I'm already thinking about snapping right now so that's just an example like already i don't know the third location could be good could be bad but i'm already thinking if this third location is amazing i'm snapping or i'm already snapping actually i have zab in my hand so I, I probably snapped already like to be fair and then second example right we have Kin crimson cosmos already feel bad about this game and then on top of that you have islands of silence i'm immediately ready to leave so uh there are games like that where i'm thinking okay these locations are really bad for me. These locations are really good for me. And you want to have that knowledge for your deck, right? Every deck's going to be a little bit different um, in the back of your head. So you can already be prepared to snap, to not snap, to leave, um, even before you even play a single card. So these are concepts you should be working towards thinking about whenever you're playing the game. Uh, next concept, take advantage of featured and hot locations. So... Uh, this is something that uh, I did a lot, especially as I'm as I'm climbing to infinite and a little bit past that, where I'm just making sure that um, there are I change things in my deck to accommodate the feature location on hot locations. I will say that hot locations are significantly more uh, important than featured, right? Because hot locations appear sixty percent, feature locations appear forty percent, and that 60% or 20% difference is huge, right? Like that that changes how often you're really going to see a location. So I'd say definitely play towards hot locations. Featured locations, you actually can kind of neglect. 40% isn't like that uh, detrimental to your game plan, but you do want to be aware of that, okay, if this location pops up, do I lose instantly? And if the answer is yes, then you probably need to, change your deck in some way where you don't lose 40% of the time, especially you don't lose 60% of the time. And then another thing on top of that is don't create unplayable decks. So what do I mean by that? Some people will see a feature location, they'll see a hot location, and then they'll go straight to deck building and they'll make their decks completely function around that location, right? And honestly, for hot locations, maybe you can like get away with it, but for feature locations, you cannot do that, right? If you're instantly losing 60% of your games just off the location doesn't flip, you are that's gonna you're gonna have a very bad day. So, you know, in some cases, it might be better to just ignore that feature location completely. Hot locations you can't really ignore, but featured you can kind of get away with but just don't create a deck that fully revolves around the featured or hot locations. And if they don't flip, then you instantly lose. Next thing is just a collection tip. Uh, while you don't have a full collection, most people don't, um, and you're still working on series three or four cards, I would say initially just focus on flexible series four, series three cards. Don't focus on series four or series five cards. They cost too much. There's too rare. There, it's not gonna be. Um, it's not gonna help your mental. They'd be like, oh, I just need the series four or five cards, right? You just have to focus on what you have, right? That's gonna be your best uh, mental state. And if you're just new, you're still collecting a lot of the series three cards. Focus on the flexible ones, the ones that can make multiple uh, compositions. So. Arrow is really good. Leader, even though I don't like this card, don't promote it, is flexible. Sarah is flexible. Death, right? So many locations use destroy effects and second then it keeps adding new ones. So death is a very good one. Daredevil has its own archetype and it's a two cost that you can put on a lot of decks. Uh, Doctor Doom is one of those flexible six drop bombs you can play that people don't really play around and you can really sneak some wins up. Lockjaw has a lot of playability a lot of ways to utilize it well electro same thing has a lot of playability ways to utilize it well brute's kind of weird but brute's just really good in silver surfer decks and it's also good in patriot decks so you have that uh, multiple use i wouldn't say it's like a card you want to like pick up first first series three card but it does have a lot of use cases you can also play it in cerebro too 
So a lot of flexibility for Brood. Sarah, a very common flexible card. And Mystique, I would say, has a lot of uses. Even if you don't have a single um, pool three card besides Mystique, you can play Dino. And then Mystique just works with so many other extra cards. So uh, these are just uh, my list of Series 3. Now, I'm not saying that you can't buy any other Series 3 card from the token shop. Like, Thor is a good example. A great card, very strong. But I'm just uh, showcasing some of the cards that can be put into more than one deck, even though Thor could be put into, like, two or three different decks. So I didn't put that in. But um, I'm just saying these ones, as I was looking through the pool three list, uh, jumped out to me as, like, oh, yeah, I can see this working in, like, three different decks here. So... Um, these are these are the ones I would focus on initially. But if you like a card, you want to play with a card, pick that. Like go for that instead, or or go for that as well. So I'm not saying these are the only you can pick. I'm just saying these are the ones that I would think are the most flexible. And I wouldn't get all of them, right? I would just pick a couple that uh, fit your playstyle, and then supplement that with your other with the other cards that you want to play right you don't need all of them or really any of them even one is all you need so i just want to clarify that it's not oh i have to take this and this and this and all of these cards you just need a couple one or two and then you build around them so that that would be my advice there all right next tip is playing to learn and and losing to learn so there are some games where I, my opponent's playing cards and I really don't know what they're doing. I'm just like, I have no idea what archetype you're playing. And uh, usually if um, I'm behind there, uh, as long as we're, you know, playing for two or four cubes, eight cubes, mm, yeah, that's not, that's not, that's not Gucci. But yeah, two or four cubes, a lot of the times I will just let the game play out. Just so that I can see their full composition, I can see their game plan, what they're thinking with the deck. And even though I'll lose the two or four cubes, I gain knowledge into the future for that archetype that I might not be too familiar with. Uh, so I do have an example. I played this game today where I was not really sure what they were doing. Um, ended up losing this game, but I did learn a little bit of like what their idea was, what they were trying to do. That kind of thing. They end up beating me with the arrow play, I believe. They played the arrow, even though I should have known uh, they were playing arrow because I took the arrow from them. But I, I still lost to it. <laughs> I, I took the arrow and I still lost to it. Uh, so definitely, um, it's because they played arrow and then turn six, they played uh, um, Doctor Strange, right? So they played Doctor Strange turn six, move the arrow to the other lane and then played the cloak on top. So I really, it really caught me off guard, right? I've not really seen that type of play uh, with all the movement that they, they, they ran with. So even though I lost the game, I learned from that game. And if, if I see a, another similar game, I might be thinking, oh, they might be playing Doctor Strange last turn to move after the arrow, uh, things like that. So um, even though, you know, you're going to lose cubes initially, you learn more in the long run. That helps you uh, in the future. So it's more of a playing to learn, playing to understand compositions and things like that. And then using that extra knowledge to gain back the cubes that you may have lost while learning. All right. So this one's going to be pretty interesting. I would say don't snap turn six unless, right? So unless you think you're not going to win. Now, I know you're, you're, you're thinking, what? Don't snap turn six unless you're not going to win. That doesn't make any sense. But actually, usually if you snap turn six um, and, and it's obvious you're going to win, they just leave. But usually if you're staying in turn six, what's going on is you, you think you might win but you also think you might lose, right? You, you're not too sure, but you're not, you're not like, oh, I've, I'm, I've completely lost here. But you're also like, no, I have, I've completely won here, right? You're like, ah, it, if they do this or they do that, uh, I could win. Or if they do this, I do this, they could win. So why I say if you don't think you're going to win by snapping, your opponents probably think in thinking of that same mindset. What? They're not 100% sure if they're winning or not, 
but you snapping could be the trigger for them to leave. So by snapping, they might be, okay, they snapped. I, I'm not sure I'm going to win. I'll leave. So even though you don't think you're going to win by snapping, you're actually giving your opponent like a reason for them to leave. So it, it might seem counterintuitive, but by snapping when you don't think you're going to win, that might trigger your opponent to leave and then you actually get the cube. So if you think you're going to win, I wouldn't really snap, right? Because if you think if you're winning that hard and you think you're going to win turn six, you snap. They just leave. It doesn't matter. But if you don't think you're going to win, that's actually when you snap. So that that's the logic behind that. Another thing that you could do, I don't do this anymore, and, and especially like after infinite, it's it's pretty toxic. But what you can do is you just wait until the end of turn six. Uh, before you snap it and your turn really quickly, right? So like a couple of seconds left, you snap snap in your turn. And if they're not paying attention, they're not, you know, really focused, you might you might get them to stay in and get like the extra four cubes, the extra two cubes. I do think this is pretty toxic uh, mentality. I don't love it. But uh, you know, this is a tips and trick guy, and I'm gonna give it to you. Though I will think you're a bad, you know, you're a bad person if you do this against me. I'm just gonna say <laughs> But I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you, like, this is something you can do, especially if you really, you really need those final cues for infinite. But it's, it, I wouldn't say it's, it's a good thing to do. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna throw that in there. But I'm not like advocating for this behavior. It's pretty toxic behavior. All right. Next thing is getting into the habit of figuring out opponent's archetypes by their second card. So you, I mean, you, some, you know, sometimes by their first card, but you know, some, some people might think that's too, too like impossible, but generally, you know, by a lot of times people will play very distinct cards that fit a specific archetype. And if you have in your, you know, in your bank, like, oh, these are all the archetypes that use this card, right? It's very easy to like, figure out oh they're playing move deck they're playing discard deck they're playing dino they're playing mr negative blah 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 there's there's so many um tells that you can figure out by just seeing their first or second card so just get in the habit of doing that automatically as soon as they play a card what archetype what archetype are they playing right and that can figure that can help you navigate what they're trying to do and how to play around that so just like have that in your mind every time you're playing Every time they play a card, what archetype is that? Next thing, same thing, right? Put yourself in the shoes of the opponent. So this is a pretty common strategy if you play a lot of card games. It doesn't really change here where you want to be thinking, what are they thinking about, right? What, are, what do they think I'm going to do? And how do I respond to that, that process? So you, you just want, you're, you're almost like at the highest levels, you're almost like playing both sides, right? Like you're like, okay, what would I do here? What, what will they do here? How do I play around what they're going to do? That kind of thing. So this is a, this is an example here where I white queen their leader, right? So I'm thinking, okay, um, what do they think? What are they going to do? Right. They're a leader player. They're just going to play leader because they don't, they don't know what else to do. Uh, but if I, so you know, what's my play? I play leader mid. Okay, what what happens if they play leader mid? It's fine for me. What if they play leader left, right? Because they can't play leader right because of nowhere. So we know both players aren't playing leader right. If they play leader left and I play leader mid, their, their leader is going to fill their board. Or my leader is going to fill their mid and I'm going to fill their left, right? But they'll win mid and right and i'll just win left right so if i play leader mid i'm i lose what if i play leader left if i play leader left and they play a leader left then we both fill the left location i still win the left location but then he I, but i also win the mid right so that one would work what what if um but you know what if he goes mid and i go left if i if he goes mid i go left then I know this is like very technical, right? Like maybe you, I don't care about this leader nonsense, but like if he goes mid, I go left, then they, he'll actually beat me, right? Because I'll fill the left location, but then he'll win mid, right? So if, if we both play leader, it becomes like a flip of like, how, how do I do this? So what I ended up doing is I didn't even play leader at all. I played my other cards. 
uh, won the right location. He played leader mid, but because I won the right location, especially since he was playing lizard, even if he, even though he copied one card, I played two cards. He he copied one of them, but I still won that right location, and then I also win the left location. So I'm just thinking what he's gonna do. I figured out leader puts a lot of RNG into it. I can guarantee the win if I just don't play the leader. So. You know, the, the problem is doing all of that in like, you know, the minute or whatever that you have to, to figure it out. But after you play a lot of times, you can like start immediately start doing it, even the turn before, because, oh, I, I got white queen the turn before. So I'm already, you know, doing that calculation. So uh, this is maybe like too complex of an example. But it, the idea is there. Like I'm putting myself in the I, in, in my opponent's shoes and trying to figure out how to you know, make sure that I, I have the best advantage to win. So. That's you know tips and tricks, maybe too 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 much, but here's here's one of them. All right, so next one, snap before your opponent knows you're winning. So I see this a lot. Like this one kind of annoys me. Anytime my opponents do this, they'll do something like Jubilee Infinite, and then they'll snap, and I'm just like, no, 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 no. You snap before you play the Jubilee. So the reason is you've created that deck, right? That deck should have a big advantage whenever you play that Jubilee, right? Whenever you play like that uh, Lockjaw into something, right? Like it should have a big power spike then. So you want to snap before they even know you're playing that Jubilee. You don't want to be like, oh, I got something good. I guess I snap. They are going to leave, right? They're going to leave. So if you actually trust your deck, if you trust like this is how the deck's supposed to win, I do this. You want to snap before your, your opponent even has an idea that this is what you're doing. So, you know, this, this is just like good snap mechanics, just making sure you snap before your opponent knows you're winning. So the, the hard part with this is like sometimes you don't even know if you're going to win, right? Like you don't know if that Jubilee is going to pull something good or bad, right? But if, if your deck's built around this combo and it's a little bit of RNG, the RNG should be tuned in your favor. So on average, you should still snap because on average, that RNG will be beneficial for you. So, you know, things like Jubilee, Lockjaw, things like, you know, even... I don't know, blah, blah, blah. You know your decks. I don't know your decks. You know your decks. But usually when you have a big play, you don't want to snap after the big play is done in your head. You want to snap before it happens, before your opponent knows that you're going to do something important. So that's just something I see a lot. It always annoys me kind of because it's like, well, you know, you could have snapped before and gotten an extra cube, right? Because like the opponent's going to leave after the infinite regardless of whether you snap or not so you're you're basically wasting a cube that's how i look at it uh when when you don't when you snap before or when you snap after the play comes out all right next thing right this is going to be pretty important take advantage of bots so um there's no secret so i want to i want to mention like uh in in my rating right I'm so far above other people that I have an influx of bots and that helps me stay above people because bots are easier than humans, right? Like they, they make mistakes. Well, more mistakes than humans do. So, um, it just, it's just known that if you get high MMR or high ranking, you're gonna, you're gonna see an increased pull of bots because there's less people in your MMR bracket to fight. So, you definitely want to take advantage of the bots whenever you see them. No matter like no matter what ranking, you should see some bots. It's definitely going to be fewer than what I see, but you still see them. And there are ways to manipulate bots into giving you more cubes. So, uh, you know, you might just you know every time you see a bot, if you're just you know not paying attention, you're like, okay, it snapped here, it snapped there, blah blah blah. It didn't snap at all. And you know, I got two cubes. I got four cubes from it. Right? There are ways to to there are some tricks right bots always snap um if they're ahead usually four five or six if they're ahead by a certain point or they're winning multiple locations they usually snap so if you can manipulate the board state where they're winning the location but you're actually ahead on the board state that's how you get them to snap even though they can't actually contest you so i do have an example here a really good example very common the opponent is barely winning me by one, right? They're they like total power. They're winning me by one, right? It's a tie in the middle. It's nine to zero on the left. It's nine to one on the right. The bot snaps here. 
I have double Spider Man. They don't even they don't even know that Spider Man messes like does 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 anything. But they're like, I'm winning total power. It's turn six. I'm snapping. So the bot will snap here, even though they have no chance. They have <laughs> they have no chance to beat this board. But if you can manipulate the board states where the bots will snap, that's how you're like you're you're getting eight cubes. You know here eight cubes there it's definitely something i've used right like yeah you know, i wouldn't say it's like the linchpin of, of climbing but it is relevant right i have to mention it that bots can be manipulated in a way where you can get more cubes than maybe you deserve <laughs> so um anytime you see a bot you know just keep that in mind there are some resources to figure out if uh players are or if the opponents are bots right gold background ink background uh, snapping immediately at, at at the start of return, uh, not respecting locations, playing counter cards immediately. Like they'll play San Chi, like on the board with no target, right? Like you don't, humans don't really do that. So there are ways to identify bots. There's also like a growing list of uh, a Google Doc with all with all of the bots that a particular player has seen. I don't know who created it, but uh, they they've done a really good job on that. So definitely something to uh realize and and keep in mind anytime you see a, a weird opponent with a weird background or ink, inked a card or lots of variants that you've never seen before um it might be a clue that you're fighting a bot opponent and you want to find a way to make sure that uh, you can maybe get an advantage there and then next tip if you're for fighting if you think you're fighting specific meta decks play the counters right so sometimes on my stream i'll get a lot of people saying i always see surfer decks i always see zabu decks it's nothing but this it's nothing but you know drac drac ghost rider stuff like that if that's the case right then play the counters play the shang chi's play the enchantress Magneto is really good against Zabu since you can move all of their cards into one location. You know, Killmonger if you're fighting Kazoos, uh, Silver uh, Cosmo if you're fighting Silver Surfers, things like that. If you think you're fighting a specific meta decks, play the counters. Uh, you'll actually find that maybe maybe either you're over ex exaggerating in like how often you're fighting these decks, or you know it does work out for you. You gain a lot of cubes. So another thing like people have been doing right against the Drac. Uh, the Drac Ghost Rider, where they want, they have Infinite and they use the Dracula to discard the Infinite, right? There, I've seen someone tech in Morph, right? They play Morph, especially like they play Moon Girl and then double Morph, and then they morph into the Infinite since it's the only card in their hand. So that kind of strategy is brilliant, right? That kind of uh, figuring out the meta and then adapting on the fly, that kind of stuff can really get you big leads, right? So. That's hard to do. It is hard to do, right? To uh, think of counters for decks like that, especially when it's not a common answer, right? Morph is not a common answer at all. So, um, but it's still it's still a good philosophy to have if you think you're fighting specific meta decks, right? Play counters, like right? put 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 a couple in, even if you know you don't play that one card, it's not gonna break your your deck a lot of the time. So, uh, definitely, I think it's something you want to keep in mind anytime you're fighting an influx of specific decks, right? Sometimes streamers will stream a deck and then, oh, everyone's playing that same deck, right? Like, that's the time. <laughs> that's the time for sure. All right, next thing, don't be disappointed by variants. So obviously there are gonna be some uh, series of games where you're gonna lose eight, lose eight, lose four, go down uh, like five ranks very quickly. It doesn't mean your deck's bad. It doesn't mean you're bad. Right, like that's kind of variance, you know, maybe, you know, also could be like you're fighting me over and over, like I've had that happen. But, you know, to, to be fair, um, there will be variance, right? I've had s scenarios where I just lose three eight cube games, right? And, you know, do I, I do, I do get up and take a break, like to be fair, I do, <laughs> I do stop. <laughs> but am I like giving up or anything like that? No, I'm just like, okay, well that happened. That sucks. Let's move on, right? So you just have to understand that, you know, sometimes people are going to have the answer. Sometimes people are going to luck out. Sometimes the locations are going to be just the nuts or whatever, and you just, like, don't have any options. But it doesn't mean that your deck's bad or anything like that. It just kind of means that sometimes the variance will not be in your favor. 
and you just have to get used to that be okay with that and move on all right now next thing don't be afraid to change the deck to fit your play style so um there's gonna be you're gonna you know you're gonna see meta decks from players and it, it doesn't mean that okay i have to run this deck and i can't change any card if you don't like a card in the deck change it you know add the cards that you like add the cards that make sense to you don't be stuck because oh I, I I got to 400 with this deck. This must be the only deck that works. That's not the case at all. Um, so, you know, feel free to adjust a deck uh, till it fits your play style and it fits like your fun uh, beaters. So it's not, it's not a rigid um, thing, deck building, right? You can change one card and it feels infinitely better or you can uh you know keep the deck and and it still works right so just don't be afraid to make a deck your own uh except if you're a leader player then be very afraid you know not a fan um, next thing is just keep a mental track of your opponents once you're high rank you tend to fight uh up like the same opponents i had like a like two week period where i fought basically like 30 people over the two weeks and it was only those people only those 30 people throughout the day and if it was if i didn't know the name it was a bot every time so um there are some uh pools of mmrs you can be into where you're fighting the same people and you can fight the people like multiple times in a row so if you keep a mental track of those people oh they play well here Oh, they're playing this deck. Oh, they like to snap here, da da da. It can help you uh, quite a bit, right? Being able to identify what a player is doing, um, what what they're thinking about, what their deck uh, functions. So it's just good. It, this isn't like a big thing, but it's just good to have a mental note of whatever, like the, the opponents that you fight a lot, and just making sure that uh, you're aware of what they're doing and and what they how they like to play. And then last tip is just make sure you subscribe to great Marvel Snap content creators. That's that's really all there is, right? So those people tend to make more guides, more videos, things helps you learn, helps you understand. So definitely something you should be doing. And I hope that you do really soon. So that's really all the tips I had. I really thought about it, tried to make sure it was as informative as possible, but like not like three hours long which it could have been but yeah hopefully this helped you out hopefully you learned a little bit hopefully um this will help you in your climb as you figure out how you want to climb and and what are the best ways to do it so that's been the tips and tricks i will be having more videos about specific concepts that we talked about here later on but uh, that's all i got for you today i hope you enjoyed it have a nice wonderful day and i'll see you in the next one